Good morning. My name is David, and I'm part of the Adult Ministries team here at Ellerslie. I'm so glad you're able to join us for Ellerslie Church online. Over the next hour, we're going to spend some time in worship through song and listen to a message from Pastor Dave. We'll be continuing our series through the book of Revelation, Hostage by Hope. Now let's join together for a time of worship. Feel free to stand, sing, or reflect on the words that are being sung as our worship team leads us. Thank you for joining our tradition service today. Please sing along with us and allow the music to bless your heart as we seek to bless the Lord together in song. Crown him with many crowns. John saw another angel flying in midair, and he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. He said in a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. Friends, we have the eternal gospel to proclaim. Let's sing about it. We have heard the joyful sound of Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Spread the tidings all around. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Bear the news to every land. Climb the steeps and cross the way. Death and endless life, Jesus saves. 
Please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, there is so much happening in the world around us. And with all the distractions, with all the uncertainty, with all the volatility that's happening, we pray, God, that we would keep our eyes focused on you, the author and the perfecter of our faith. When we're overwhelmed by the coronavirus or by the economy or by what's taking place at work or at home, God, we pray that you would forgive us that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit and we would keep our eyes focused on you, knowing that there is nothing that surprises you and you are completely in control of everything that is taking place. God, we pray that you would give the medical professionals around the world wisdom and insight to figure out a vaccine to defeat the coronavirus, that we would continue to, to pray and to uphold our government leaders at the federal, provincial, and local levels as they're making decisions with finances, with economy, with how do we support our citizens at this time. It's easy to get frustrated because nothing is going to happen exactly the way we want it to. But God, for all of our government leaders, that you would give them wisdom and insight so that we might move forward and come out of this even better and stronger than before. And God, as we continue to think about what the book of Revelation means, may we be hostaged by hope and drawn deeper into a relationship with you. We pray all these things in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. Before we jump into this week's service, we have a few things that we think you need to know about. As many of you know, we've been meeting for church online and on site over the past few weeks. And starting next week, we're going to have a new service times. Online church will still be at 930 for traditions and 1030 for renew. And you can join us on site for one service at 1030. For more information on on site church and to register, head on over to erbc.ca slash regathering. Next week, we'll be participating in communion as part of our service. Please be prepared for this by picking up some bread or crackers and some juice. Your faithful giving allows us to continue producing our services, devotional videos, and to support both our local care teams and our global missions partners all around the world. There are a variety of ways that you can continue to support Ellerslie, including by mail, setting up pre-authorized giving, and giving online. For more information on these options and to give online, head over to erbc.ca slash give. Now, grab your pen, a notebook, and a Bible, and let's dive into this week's message from the book of Revelation. For those of you who are watching live, good morning. For those of you who are listening throughout the rest of the week, thank you for making us part of your day. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the book of Revelation. We thank you for these pictures, these images, these symbols, and the glory of your son, Jesus Christ. God, I pray that as my words fall down, yours would be lifted up. And by the power of your Holy Spirit, speak to every single one of us who is listening so that we might hear what you want to say into our lives. We pray this in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. Every choice has a consequence. We make hundreds, if not thousands of decisions every single day. How are you going to spend your day? What are you going to do with your free time? How are you going to spend your evenings? Do you go on a walk? Do you sit down? Do you go on a bike ride with your family? Do you respond to an email, text, or talk to your neighbor? And in what way? What do you eat? On and on and on these decisions go. The vast majority of these decisions in a vacuum really don't matter much. Who cares if you have two pieces of dessert on a Friday night and don't work out on a Wednesday? Big deal. But if you were to have two pieces of dessert every single night for a month and not work out for a month, you may not like the consequences. Some consequ uh, choices have longer term effects as well. Like where do we live as most adults in this room have to make that decision? Are we going to rent or are we going to buy? Renting is great. You don't have to worry about special levies on your condo. You don't have to think about replacing appliances. All you need to do is write a monthly check and call it a day. Owning a house is great too. You get to build up some equity. You've probably built some deeper roots and you think about how you can design your house and your yard and 
live in that beautiful place. There's also some choices that have long-term consequences. This summer marks the 75th anniversary of the end of World War II. In April of 1945, Adolf Hitler recognized his dictatorship was coming to an end and decided to take his own life. The Nazis surrendered later that week, but one nation decided we are not going to stop. Over the next three months, from July, from April to July, the Japanese killed half as many people in three months as all people died in the span of three years. High-ranking U.S. military officers had to decide, what are we going to do with the Japanese? Military commanders like Dwight Eisenhower spoke to the president and said, by our speculation, it will take one million American lives to destroy all of Japan. That left President Harry Truman with a very difficult choice to make. And on August 6th, 1945, after wrestling with it with great intensity, he decided to drop the atomic bomb on Hiroshima. Three days later, a second bomb was dropped on Nagasaki. In four days, well over 100,000 Japanese were killed. And in the upcoming weeks and months, tens of thousands more died because of radiation poisoning. Less than a week after that second bomb was dropped, the Japanese emperor announced his country's unconditional surrender to end World War II. Every choice has a consequence. Thankfully, you and I don't have to make the type of decisions that President Harry Truman had to make. But we do make one decision that has an eternal consequence. Thankfully, it's a little bit more binary and not all wrapped up in the morality that Harry Truman had. Will we choose life and worship Jesus? Or will we choose death and worship the dragon? Every choice has a consequence. If you have your Bibles with you, I invite you to open them up to Revelation chapter 14. If you don't have a Bible with you, you can download one on your smartphone or your tablet or hop on BibleGateway.com. Revelation 14 is at the end of the Bible. 14 uh, is the chapter number, which is the big number. The small numbers are the verse numbers. And as you open up Revelation chapter 14, allow me to give you a little bit of context. Chapters 12 to 14 are a section that I like to call the cosmic battle. In chapter 12, we have a baby, a woman, and a dragon. The dragon, which represents Satan, tries to kill the baby, who is Jesus, and is thrown out of heaven and hurled to the ground. The dragon, knowing that he has lost the war against God, decides, I'm going to put all my attention into deceiving God's people, which is what we looked at last week in Revelation 13. It ends with some of these horrifying words. This is verses 16 to 18. He, the dragon, forced everyone small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on his right hand or on his forehead. So no one could buy or sell unless he had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of his name. This calls for wisdom. If anyone has insight, let him calculate the number of the beast, for it is man's number. His number is 666 feels a little hopeless, doesn't it? He forces everyone to get that number. How are we so supposed to buy food? How are we supposed to make money? What is life going to look like at that time? And in the midst of that moment where it feels like all is lost, as happened so many times in the book of Revelation, we're giving this emotional whiplash. And we enter Revelation chapter 14, the first part, the worship of the lamb. This is verses one to five. Then I looked and there before me was the lamb stand, standing on Mount Zion and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a sound from heaven, like the roar of rushing water and like a loud peal of thunder. The sound I heard was like that of harpists playing their harps. And they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. No one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. These are those who did not defile themselves with women, for they kept themselves pure. They follow the lamb wherever he goes. They were purchased from among men and offered as first fruits to God and the lamb. No lie was found in their mouths. They are blameless. I really appreciate the image that Pastor Mel has given to us as revelation as an art gallery. 
Imagine being in that room of the cosmic battle, which is our chapters 12, 13, and 14. And you look at one painting and it's this dragon in a fight with a woman and a baby. And then you look at another picture, Revelation 13, and it's these incredible beasts that are so terrifying to look at with seven heads and 10 horns and 10 crowns with a body like a leopard and a face like a lion and pears like a boss, uh, paws like a bear. And then you think it's over only to turn around and look at that last chapter in the section, chapter 14. And you find Jesus surrounded by 144,000 people. The number is symbolic to say an incredible number of people who are worshiping and praising and chanting the name of Jesus. Well, there is a beast who wants to drain our life of hope and meaning we can be reminded that there is always a God who reminds you how great and awesome and holy and powerful is he. I really enjoy going to the movies. And last year was one of the greatest cinematic events that I can remember. After 10 years of Marvel movies, we are brought to this moment The evil supervillain, a man by the name of Thanos, wants to conquer Earth. And three of Earth's greatest superheroes, Captain America, Thor, and Iron Man, stand in his way. And there's this great showdown. And Thanos destroys Iron Man and Thor. And then he fights Captain America. And he breaks a shield that's supposed to be unbreakable. He makes his leg and his arm bleed. And then Thanos' army of a demonic horde shows up behind him and Captain America is standing there completely by himself. And yet he gets up one more time. He's bloodied up. He has a face covered in dirt. And then he hears a cackling in his ear that says, Cap, are you there? On your left. And there's this beautiful moment in the movie where these portals start to open up and a hero shows up. And a few more portals open up and a few more heroes show up until all of these portals open up and all of these superheroes that Marvel has introduced in the last 10 years are standing behind Captain America. The movie has the music changed to this incredible, epic victory sound. And you know, before the fight has even begun, the victory is won. Before the fight has even begun, The victory is won. I've watched this movie in its entirety two different times, but I've probably watched this scene a dozen. Even to this day, it sends chills down my spine and will absolutely pale in comparison to the picture that John saw on Mount Zion. There's a heavenly army, 144 thousand people standing around God. This number is symbolic. The number 10 is symbolic for a complete list. The number 12 in the Old Testament represents the tribes of Israel in the New Testament, the 12 disciples. 12 times 12 is 144 times 10. It says this is a great and complete number. Times 10 again. And it says this number is swelling to a large group of people. Times 10 again. And this number is beyond imagination. And just like chapter 13 ends by saying the followers of the beast will have a mark. Chapter 14 begins by saying, and the followers of Jesus will have a mark. So really quickly, let's go up four of, through what four of these marks might look like. The first mark is purchased. In some of your translations, it might be redeemed. How do we know that we've been purchased or redeemed by God? Because he has bought us with his blood. When Jesus died on the cross, he paid for our sins, his blood in replacement of ours. Anyone who believes in Jesus has been paid for in full. He is sealed with the spirit. He is guaranteed an eternal inheritance. And whether we go back to Revelation chapter seven, where we're first introduced to the 144,000 or go back even further to Ephesians chapter one, we are told that we are marked. We are sealed with the Holy spirit. We are purchased. We are redeemed. We belong to God. The second mark is one of a virgin. This idea doesn't literally mean someone who hasn't had sex, but is a well-used biblical metaphor. 
The Old Testament is filled with sexual imagery that we have in ourselves a beautiful relationship with God. While those who follow the city of Babylon are called harlots or prostitutes. In choosing to follow God, we completely shift our allegiance. We are no longer worshiping sports or money or power or family or whatever the new shiny bauble might be. Instead, we are called to worship God and God alone. It doesn't just mean whatever we give on Sundays belongs to God. It doesn't mean that this one hour we spend watching online belongs to God. God is saying, I am in charge of all of your money and all of your time. But you steward this well, which is a good translation or transition to the third mark as followers. We have our own idea of how life should be lived. But upon becoming followers of Jesus, we realize his plan is so much greater than ours. There's a powerful story in John chapter six, where Jesus has just fed 5,000 people. And he gets together with a smaller group of people, not just his 12 disciples, but those disciples who are constantly following him, probably a number of about 75 to 100 people. And these people say, Jesus, show us a sign in the same way that Moses brought manna down from heaven. Give us a sign yourself. And Jesus replies, I am the bread of life from heaven. And in feeding on you, you will live forever. Well, these words are a little bit difficult to hear. And it says most of those disciples chose to leave. And then Jesus focuses on the 12. He looks at them and says, what say you? To which Peter replies, Lord, where should we go? You have the words of eternal life and we will follow you. Finally, we are marked as blameless. What an incredible picture this is. The scriptures don't say we're sinless. We know we've fallen short. We know we've missed the mark, but it says we are blameless by the power of Jesus saving work. He purifies us. He cleanses us. He makes us whole because of what Jesus has done. We are blameless in God's sight. If our choice to follow Jesus has these incredibly powerful consequences, let us choose to worship the lamb because the consequences of worshiping the dragon aren't quite so positive, which leads us to the second part of our message this morning. Flee the dragon. This is verses six and seven. Then I saw another angel flying in midair and he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. He said in a loud voice, fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens and the earth, the sea and the springs of water. In a book about the end times, we're actually well past the halfway mark before we read judgment for the very first time. It's almost like the angel is saying, look, enough warning. Stuff is about to get real. If you want to come over to the winning team, God accepts all sorts of bandwagon jumpers. Come worship the lamb. Because our choices have eternal consequences. And do you really want to be on the wrong side? And judgment is probably the number one question my friends have about Christianity. Dave, maybe I would come to church and I'll talk to you about God and Jesus and the Bible. But what do you do with all this genocide? I want to encourage you. We do not worship a God with a short fuse. When God promises to Abraham way back in Genesis that one day his people will be taken into the promised land. He allows those inhabitants of the promised land 400 years to repent before the Israelites come in. Upon Jesus' death and resurrection, as you well know, 2,000 years have passed. I love how Peter describes it. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, where he says, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Already during the course of this book, we receive warning after warning after warning. And as though the angel is saying, look, things are about to get really bad here. We know you've made bad choices. That's okay. Come to the winning team. Your sins are forgiven. Worship the lamb because this choice will bring the greatest and most beautiful consequence you could ever imagine. 
In verse eight, a second angel appears with another warning and says, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, which made all the nations drink the maddening wine of her adulteries. Back in the spring, our church held a three-part webinar called Digiting, uh, Digiting, <laughs> Parenting in a Digital Age. The first time we got together, Sid Coop, who works with our youth ministry and is part of our staff team, he said, understand that this parenting in this season is completely different than what we've seen before. The next couple of sessions were specifically about pornography and about video games. And one of the sobering comments from that time together was the reality that he said, and it went something like this. It's not just about protecting our kids from pornography, but how to respond when they eventually see it. It's not just about protecting, but how are they to respond when they see it, not if they see it, when they see it, with smartphones, with tablets, with laptops. It's never been more easy to access pornography and it's impacting our culture like never before. When we read about Babylon in the book of Revelation, the idea is to understand Babylon is whatever will take you away from Jesus. What shiny new bauble does Satan want to deceive you with? Is it the lure of power? Is it keeping up with the Joneses? Is it the empty promise of social media? Is it an addiction to video games or a hundred other possibilities? The enemy does not care what seduces you as long as it takes you away from Jesus. But notice what the angel says. Babylon has fallen. The regime is over. It's already fallen. Babylon has already lost. The dragon has already lost. The devil has already lost. Come to the winning team. Your choices have consequences. Make the right one. Then the third angel speaks in verses 9 to 11. Third angel followed them and said in a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on the forehead or on his hand, he too will drink the wine of God's fury which has been poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. He will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the lamb and the smoke of their torment rises forever and ever. There is no rest day or night. Do you see the progression that happened there? The first angel kind of giving a warning. The second one, the regime is over. Babylon has fallen. The third angel Please understand how bad this is. If you find these three verses difficult to follow, verse 20, the last verse in this chapter is devastating. Time does not permit for a theology on the wrath of God, but I say with great conviction, wrath of God is a good thing. I kept looking at my notes that I had taken earlier on in the week, and I couldn't get past this big idea that I'll share with you. If God is God, then Babylon cannot stand. God who is holy and perfect and pure and blameless cannot stand with sin. God and Babylon cannot coexist forever. A perfect and holy God cannot put up with human trafficking and it will face the wrath of God. He is disgusted by physical, emotional, and sexual abuse, the atrocities of genocide, of abortion, of murder must be brought to an end. These sins and others must be paid for in full, either by Jesus or by us. Choose wisely. I remember listening to an interview with Timothy Keller and a journalist who was asking him questions. And the journalist didn't seem to have a Christian background. And he said to him, Dr. Keller, do you believe that hell is really a place with fire and brimstone and these horrors that the Bible talks about? And Keller goes, no, I don't. And the interviewer kind of does this nervous laugh and says, good. And Keller says, oh, no, 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 wait. I think it's significantly worse than that. Friends, the warning light is on. The amber alert is going. And the angels are saying here and throughout the rest of the book of Revelation, your choices have consequences. Make the right one. Follow Jesus as the holy, pure, and perfect lamb of God. The second, this section ends with Revelation's second benediction. This is verses 12 and 13. 
This calls for patient endurance on the part of the saints who obey God's commandments and remain faithful to Jesus. Then I heard a voice from heaven say, Write, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit. They will rest from their labor, for their deeds will follow them. This is the first time in over 10 chapters that John is asked to write something. In fact, a few chapters ago, the angel specifically says, don't write this part down. But in the midst of all of these images, in the midst of the warnings of the angels, in the midst of all of these pictures, he is told by an, a voice from heaven, John, let it be known, blessed are the dead. Three times over this past week, I had conversations with someone who was talking to me about the death of a loved one. And all three of these people, all talking about their moms, said, but now mom is with Jesus. It's completely countercultural in a place where we're looking for that fountain of youth and that place where we're looking to extend life forever. A voice from heaven says, blessed are the dead. As we live And as we walk on this earth, we are called to make disciples. We are called to endure. We are called day in and day out to make choices, to make decisions that have eternal impact for the glory of Jesus. And if you're listening to this message and thinking, Dave, what's the application? What do I do? Know that whatever your job, whatever your role, whatever your family situation, you are called to make disciples to help them endure, to point them to the beauty and the glory of Jesus. And if you're listening online and you're thinking, Dave, how can I learn more about that? Well, let me tell you. We have a program called Alpha. It's an opportunity to explore the Christian faith. There's videos, there's discussion, and our leaders are well trained to invite you to come in and ask whatever questions are on your mind. It's a beautiful place and a safe place to explore who Jesus is. And if some of you are watching and going, David, it's it's been too long. I've been following this dragon that you talk about. And I've been on the fence. And today I want to make a decision to follow Jesus. What do I do? Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, forgive me for the decisions that I have made in the past. I know that I have fallen short of your perfection. But I believe that Jesus died for my sins and rose three days later and is one day coming back. I don't have all the answers. I don't know what this means, but I want to live with you for eternity. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, welcome to the family. Send us an email at office at erbc.ca. We would love to be in touch with you and talk to you about the journey and what might the the next steps be. Before we tackle this next section, I want to give a personal aside. I have loved working with Mel through the book of Revelation. I cannot tell you how much fun I've had studying and preparing these messages. And believe me, they have not been easy to learn about the original context, to gain a further understanding of the symbolism, to work hard at presenting something that is hopefully easy to understand. It has been an incredible joy. And you may have noticed that over part of this journey, we have not talked about, well, is Jesus going to show up before these bad things happen in the middle of these bad things happening or after these bad things happening? And you'd be right. Both Mel and I are working hard not to make those absolute statements of that sort. But here's what we can say. We know Jesus is coming back. You might be saying, Dave, why are you talking about this? The final section of our passage today has commentators divided right down the middle. Is this a harvest for heaven? Is this a harvest for hell? Is it one of each? Which one is it? We can't say for certainty. And rather than me walking through all of the options, rather than me setting up a straw man that I can easily knock down, I'm simply going to tell you what I think. But whether I'm right or whether I'm wrong, we know this for sure. Judgment is coming. And our choices have very real consequences. We worship the lamb. We flee the dragon because we know judgment 
is coming. This is 14 to 16. I looked and there before me was a white cloud and seated on the cloud was one like a son of man with a crown of gold on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Another angel came out of the temple and called in a loud voice to him who was sitting on the cloud, take your sickle and reap because the time to reap has come for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who was seated on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth and the earth was harvested. I believe these verses 14 to 16 is a picture of Jesus who is reaping a harvest for heaven. And I believe the verses we'll read in just a moment or two, 17 to 20, is a picture of an angel gathering grapes for hell. This is a chapter about choices and consequences. We start by looking at the lamb surrounded by his army and the beauty and the majesty of what that looks like. The second section is these three angels who are warning us, flee the dragon, flee the dragon, flee the dragon. And then we get to the last part of the chapter. And I think what the author is trying to tell us is that first part is a harvest for the lamb. The second part, a gathering for the dragon. Even the choice of words John uses is interesting. If you have your Bible in front of you, take another look at verse 15 and you'll see what I mean. It says, take your sickle and reap because the time to reap has come for the harvest of the earth is ripe. These are positive words, none of which are found in verses 17 to 20. Jesus reaps and harvests while the angel we're about to look at simply gathers. We also read the word harvest as an overwhelmingly positive term throughout the gospels. In John chapter four, verse 35, Jesus says, look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for the harvest. In Matthew chapter nine, Jesus says to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Jesus is gathering the faithful. The angel That's a different story. Verses 17 to 20. Another angel came out of the temple in heaven and he too had a sharp sickle. Still another angel who had charge of the fire came from the altar and called in a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle. Take your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of grapes from the earth's vine because its grapes are ripe. The angel swung his sickle on the earth, gathered its grapes and threw them into the great wine press of God's wrath. They were trampled in the wine press outside the city and blood flowed out of the press, rising as high as the horse's bridles for bridles for a distance of 1600 stadia. I used to live in the wine capital of Canada. I passed vineyards every day to and from work. And while I'm not going to say I'm an expert on how to make wine, this I know for sure. You don't get grapes with a sickle. You pluck them off with your bare hands. Do you know what would happen if you went into a vineyard with a sickle? Oh, you'd get grapes, but you'd also get branches and you would completely destroy the vineyard. But who cares? Because it's going to be thrown into the wine press of God's wrath. Anyway, one commentator makes a really interesting observation about the angel in verse 18, who is in charge of the fire. While most people kind of glaze over this because they really want to focus on verse 20. This one commentator made an interesting observation. He said, the prayers of the men and women who are crying out is the fire on that altar. And the men and women, the saints on earth are saying, how long, O Lord, must we cry for justice? And you do not answer. How long before we face persecution and famine and danger and nakedness and sword? How long before you do something about all these people who are persecuting us? God, are you going to respond or not? The chapter begins with a victorious picture of the lamb. And then a warning that Babylon is falling. God's anger has reached a boiling point. He's gathered all who blaspheme his name and worship his dragon and worship the dragon. And wrath has arrived. In a very disturbing picture, we see a river of blood that's four feet high and goes for 300 kilometers. Our choices have very real consequences. Let me close with this. Maybe you're sitting there and saying, Dave, 
I've made some bad decisions. I've made some choices and now I'm living with those consequences. I look right in the camera and I say, me too. I think if we're being honest, all of us have made choices and have made decisions and have lived with consequences that we're not really happy about. We're not comparing right now and we can tell stories some other time. But let's be honest. We've made some decisions that we wish we would never have made. I started this last section by saying, I might be wrong. And let's pretend for the sake of a moment that I am. What if those last four verses in verses 17 to 20 that end with that closing line that is so horrific isn't about the wrath of people who are being sent to hell? What if it's actually the wrath of God upon his son, Jesus Christ? Because Jesus was taken out of a great city. Jesus was taken up onto a high hill. Jesus was killed so that we might have life. And what if one word is changed in verse 20? Jesus was trampled in the wine press outside the city and blood flowed out of the press, rising as high as the horse's bridles for a distance of 1,600 stadia. A river of blood running from the cross, four feet deep, 300 kilometers long, enough blood to cleanse the whole world of our sin. We are hostaged by hope because one man's choice has offered all of humanity the blessing and the beautiful consequence of spending eternity with him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, help us to endure. When life throws curveballs at us, when life gets difficult, when we feel like we can't do it anymore, that we would not run away from you, but that we would run towards you, that we would cling to you, knowing that our choices matter and knowing that the best choice we could ever make is worshiping Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, and being brought into eternal glory with the Father, the Spirit, and all those who have gone before us. We pray this in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. Thanks for joining us. It was great to worship together and to dive into the message. Linked in the description down below, you'll find a digital bulletin that has some church updates and more information for you. This is a great resource for finding about what programs and events are happening throughout the week. If you enjoyed our service, feel free to give this video a like, share it with your friends, and subscribe to stay tuned with all of our video content right here on YouTube. As we wrap up, feel free to hang out in the chat for a few minutes as the slides roll, and we'll see you next week. Have a good one.